It is 1 p.m. here in East Africa and you're tuned in to Africa Live. Thank you for joining us. I am Penny Nakarika. Look at what's more to come this half hour. Gearing for polls, Zimbabwe's presidential contender seek a green light to run for office. And Britain Andy Murray sails through the fourth round in his bid to win the Wimbledon title. in Egypt where three people have been killed and 250 injured in an outbreak of violence in several Egyptian cities. Opponents and supporters of President Morsi clashed, each side blaming the other for initiating violence. The Muslim Brotherhood's Freedom and Justice Party of offices have been attacked and set on fire. For more, let's cross over live to CCTV's Adal Maruki joining us live from Cairo. Adal, what's the latest at this moment? Well, so far it has been calm all over Egypt uh, after a long series of clashes in about four main cities in Egypt uh, that left, as you said, three uh, were confirmed dead, including one U.S. citizen or an American citizen in clashes in Egypt's coastal city of Alexandria. Uh, also, the third death casualty resulted from an explosive uh, that was thrown in Port Said city at the protesting uh, group or the uh, protesters from the opposition against President Morsi. Uh, just a few minutes ago, the police have confirmed that the explosion happened. And it was first thought to be a gas cylinder, but the police report confirmed that it is a manufactured small explosive device, which indicates a terrorist attack and a planned um, explosion for the protesters there. Well, the military had said that it would get involved if the situation gets out of hand. Any word from them? Well, um, so far there hasn't been any official statement, but there is a very clear and evident presence of the armed forces in the streets. They are protecting the main locations, the Central Bank of Egypt, other banking locations. Uh, also, they have been near the airport, uh, near the uh, locations for uh, the Egyptian prisons. Uh, so they are securing the entire uh, country. They're making sure that all volatile locations are protected fiercely. Uh, but uh, so far, uh, they haven't commented even on the clashes. Uh, all what we have heard before is President uh, um, the defense minister's words, who said that reconciliation should be achieved before uh, th June 30th. Uh, other than that, the army said it will prevent bloodshed, but some analysts believe that the army will not inter intervene directly or immediately as soon as the clashes that we've seen yesterday. They believe that the army could interfere when the bloodshed is getting wider and there is uncontrollable chaos all over the country. Before that, analysts don't believe that the army would interfere. So, Adele, you tell us the defense minister had talked of uh, reconciliation. President Mursi had also talked about dialogue over the situation. Has there been any move from either side towards having that dialogue? Unfortunately, mm, nothing at all from any side. The opposition are still holding firm to their position to boycott all dialogue with the president unless what they described as guarantees to serious uh, dialogue. They have been demanding to sack the prime minister whose government has uh, a consensus over its weak performance from all political parties in Egypt, including some of the allies to the Muslim Brotherhood themselves, uh, the Salafi Nur party, which is the second biggest elected political party uh, during the new, uh, newly formed democratic Egypt. Uh, putting uh, that aside, um, they also have uh, demanded early presidential elections and they don't want to talk unless it is about setting a date for the early presidential elections. Of course, on the other hand, Islamists uh, see that they have constitutional rights for President Morsi to continue his term. Uh, uh, he, have, he has only made it through the first year, so he has three more years left. And some of the supporters, actually many of the supporters, have been quite uh, trying to send irritating messages to the opposition saying that they will re-elect President Morsi after that so he would stay for longer. Uh, so this debate has been going in infinite circles with no improvement. Both sides are still holding 
quite dear to their demands and they're not showing the intent to give any more uh, sacrifices. All right, Adele, we'll be watching the twists and turns to that story. Thanks very much for joining us. Adele Mahri live in Cairo. A U.S. President, Barack Obama, is pitching foreign aid and, by extension, an image of a new Africa, not one of malnourished children, but one of smiles and plump babies. Obama, on Friday, toured a series of booths set up behind his Dakar hotel that were designed to showcase Senegalese agriculture with a focus on nutrition and fortified foods. Among the food initiatives, as Feed the Future, a public-private partnership initiated in 2010 that the administration says has helped 7 million small farmers in 19 developing nations, including 7,000 in Senegal. The U.S. foreign aid in an age of budget squeezes is often first in line for cutbacks. Meanwhile, Senegalese President Macky Sall says that Africa needs more help to fight terrorism. The Senegalese President said on Friday that he told U.S. President Barack Obama that Africa needed more help from Washington in its fight against terrorism. Sall, who held talks with Obama in Dakar on Thursday, said they had discussed the growing threat from Al-Qaeda-linked groups in the Sahara Desert and arid Sahel belt that stretches across Africa from the east to the west. This follows Obama's visit to Senegal on the first leg of his three nations. African tour. Saul also argued that the United States, as well as the European Union and France, had a crucial role to play in helping African countries to overcome a lack of capacity and resources in the fight against Islamist groups. We need training, we need materials, uh, we need intelligence, and uh, we need uh, cooperation between uh, Africa, USA, Africa, EU, Africa, and France. And we, we, we need that our, our friends will uh, cooperate with us to, to help to, to build those capacities. All right, you're watching Africa Live. Let's take a break when we come back. Meeting Mandela's, visiting U.S. President Barack Obama, set to meet Mandela's family. And gearing for polls, Zimbabwe's presidential contender seek a green light to run for office. latest trends in global politics, economics, culture and sport and how Africa fits into the global picture. You decide what's important. We need some trade and justice. Africa's future will be determined by Africa. For women's equal opportunity for a better life. We have to change something and it's not the, the, the outsiders. Talk Africa, a new voice for the world. back as U.S. President Barack Obama continues his Tri-Nations tour in South Africa. He insists he's unlikely to meet with former President Nelson Mandela, who is still critically ill in a Pretoria hospital undergoing treatment for a recurring lung infection, but will meet with members of Mandela's family. The U.S. President has described Mr. Mandela as a hero for the world. Mandela's ex-wife Winnie Mandela said on Friday that it would not be right for President Obama to meet with Mandela while he was in a critical no condition but added that although clinically he is still unwell, there is great improvement. South Africans have continued to send get well messages for the ailing anti-apartheid icon. Um, he has done a lot for South Africa, so uh, for a man this on uh, a man honest like this to be in a condition like this, it 
touches a lot of South Africans' lives. So um, we wish all the best for him and wish that he recovers in time. Actually, I don't really feel happy about the condition now, but it's only God that can... It's, it's God that owns life. Anything can happen. But I think the man, the man is old enough is old enough to go. So I don't know why they're still keeping him. If God says yes, let him go. But you just, because for somebody to be on the machine on, in the hospital for a very long time, I think it's very painful for him. So it's better if God says it's, it's, it's time to go, let him go. Right, let's now cross live to Pretoria, where CCTV's Famida Miller joins us from. Um, Famida, what's the latest on former President Nelson Mandela's health? Any news? Thanks, Penina. Well, here in Pretoria, a number of people have gathered outside the Pretoria Hospital where Nelson Mandela is receiving treatment, and that's been the pattern over the last week or so. Now, looking at some of the information that's come out from government up till now, and um, as viewers will be aware, it's the South African government, it's the presidency that is uh, tasked with dispensing information about uh, Mr. Mandela's condition. Now, the last official word we got from them was on a Thursday afternoon when they had said that uh, they had seen an improvement in Mr. Mandela. However, he's still critical, but now they've used the word stable. Following that, as you had mentioned earlier, Panina, um, Mr. Mandela's former wife, Winnie Madikizela Mandela, had uh, addressed the media on Friday afternoon, reiterating that statement, said she'd seen a great improvement and uh, that there wasn't any further information she could give, but of course there was an improvement. Now, since then, since Thursday and since Friday afternoon, we've not received any official word from government as to Mr. Mandela's condition. Media still wait outside the Pretoria Hospital with receiving treatment. Now, a lot of speculation has gone round concerning U.S. President Barack Obama's visit to South Africa. He, of course, arrived on Friday evening. And uh, there was speculation specifically around whether or not he would be visiting Mr. Mandela. Now, since then, a U.S. official has come out to say that Mr. Obama will not be visiting the hospital. And instead, his wife, Michelle, and himself will spend some time with the Mandela family in private to show support, as they say that visiting Mandela could uh, uh, impede on his uh the peace that he's experiencing as well as the comfort in the hospital so would they prefer to stay on the sidelines and visit with the family alone panina and for me what is the general feel around the hospital and the city itself are south africans assured that mandela will pull through But Nina, generally it has been a roller coaster of emotions around South Africa. It's been, today is three weeks now that Mr. Mandela has been in hospital. And uh, as you can see around me, there are a number of people visiting the hospital outside. There's a wall of tributes of posters, placards, balloons, messages to Mr. Mandela, as well as his family expressing concern, expressing support, and ultimately love. But looking at how South Africans feel so much has happened over the last few weeks, there is of course some sort of uh, a level of resignation to some extent about Mr. Mandela's fate. He's 94 years old and he's, he's not doing well. And uh, I suppose there's some element of the inevitable possibly coming at some stage. But looking at what's come from government in the last day or two regarding some sort of improvement from uh, Mr. Mandela, there are people visiting the hospital today who say they still hope that the situation will change. They hope good news will come out of the hospital and from government regarding Mr. Mandela's condition. They say all is not lost. Um, they are open to anything happen, but there is a sort of not a somber mood around the hospital but certainly a respectful mood people still continuing to bring tributes to the former president and ultimately hoping for the best but accepting what the reality could eventually be panina indeed famita thanks for joining us let's now cross over to johannesburg professor daryl glazer joins us live from there professor daryl glazer is the head of political studies at wit school of social sciences thank you for joining us professor it's another day of anxious waiting for south africans but is is there a sense now that perhaps the worst is over? Do you feel that presidencies, that the presidency's health updates have perhaps reassured South Africans? Well, South Africans have, uh, I think, for some time now been coming to terms with the likelihood the, that Nelson Mandela will die in the relatively near future. Uh, a lot of people in South Africa, especially in the media, are understandably uh, suspicious of the way uh, the government releases information. 
the presidency uh, in particular, because uh, the government here uh, has a reputation for not always uh, wanting to maximize the free flow of information. But I suppose in this situation, uh, you know, they're having to, on the one hand, manage a, a personal uh, a sadness for the family and a public political story. And it is a very difficult uh, combination to manage. And I suspect the government uh, the, and the presidency would be criticized uh, however it handled it. Uh, e even within the Mandela family, there appear to be divisions about exactly how to approach the media, how to communicate what's going on. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, South Africans continue to wait uh, anxiously, even though they are more or less reconciled to the fact that Nelson Mandela is going to die uh, b uh, before very long. Professor, Nelson Mandela had a strong and, and weak point. How easy was it for him to accept this role of global hero? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? You know, just saying that uh, Nelson Mandela had strong and weak points, just like any other person, and wondering how easy it was for him to accept this role of global hero. Uh, you know, uh, Nelson Mandela, when he came out of uh, prison, was already uh, an old man. And uh, he had a huge uh, burden of responsibility on his uh, shoulders. He uh, had the, ho the whole uh, of the world's attention on him. I think he, he reveled in it at one level, uh, but I think he also found it uh, exhausting at another. Um, he uh, was always very clear about the fact that he was not uh, a saint, uh, but his uh, contribution to South Africa, his crucial contribution, I think, really uh, was with respect to the, the transition from apartheid to democracy. Um, and uh, you know he'll always be revered for uh, by most people at least for his his role in that period. But I think uh, he he did in the end find all the attention uh, exhausting. And one final question to you, Professor. And this is a question that many people have. It is why Nelson Mandela chose only to serve one term as president. I mean, how different might the country have been had he served two? Oh, it's very difficult to say how different the country would have been. You know, in, in a way, uh, Nelson Mandela pres preserved his mystique and his reputation by uh, quitting after a, a single term. And one could even argue that it was a kind of a, a gift to South African democracy to provide this example of a leader who was stepping down rather than uh, clinging to power at all costs. So uh, I, I don't think uh, necessarily uh, South Africa would have turned out very differently because policy in any case was not uh, Mandela's strong point. And I think already halfway through his first term, he was not uh, directly in control of the daily levers of government. He'd already delegated authority to uh, his deputy president, Thabo Mbeki, who became his successor. And there were considerable tensions between the two. And I think Mandela, as I said already, he was an old man, at that time, uh, he was uh, already, he was exhausted. And uh, I think maybe he felt uh, the most important work that he had to do uh, had been done. All right, Professor Daryl Glaze, alive in Johannesburg, thank you very much for your time. Now, aspiring candidates in Zimbabwe's forthcoming general elections have started submitting their applications to the nomination court. The court was set up by the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission to approve presidential, parliamentary and council election candidates. Submission of applications closed at 4 p.m. Friday, closing the door for participation and those who failed to beat the deadline. Officials representing President Robert Mugabe, Prime Minister Morgan Changirai, and Industry and Trade Minister Welshman Ngube, the leaders of the coalition government, were buoyant today as they lodged applications on behalf of their principals. Millions of Zimbabwe out there, they want change and they just want to get it over and done it. When it comes to the end of the inclusive government, the leader of Zambia are very confident that uh, Approval of candidates by the nomination court is one of the key steps ahead of watershed elections that will bring the curtain down on a four-year coalition. President Mugabe has proclaimed July 31st as election day 
However, court applications seeking a two-week extension to that date await hearing by the highest court in the land. Today marks a significant step in Zimbabwe's electoral roadmap. Not only is the constitutional court sitting, but the final session of the current parliament will also be held this afternoon. In addition to that, the Constitutional Court has announced that the 4th of July is the date it will sit to hear applications relating to an extension of Zimbabwe's poll date. The court had previously postponed indefinitely hearing those cases, but setting next week Thursday as the date that should bring some finality to the issues surrounding Zimbabwe's elections. Farai Mwakutuya, CCTV, Harare, Zimbabwe. Let's head to Somalia, where infighting has ensued within the top ranks of the Al-Qaeda-linked Al-Shabaab group in the Horn of Africa. In a dramatic move, one of the top Al-Shabaab leaders surrendered to the self-ruled authorities of Adado town in central Somalia. The Mogadishu government now wants Sheikh Hassan Tahir Awais to be handed over. Officials of the Hemin and Heb administration of central Somalia confirmed that one of Al-Shabaab's top leaders had withdrawn on Wednesday. Sheikh Hassan Dahir Awais, once a dreaded holy warrior of the Al-Shabaab network, had recently led a rebel faction within Al-Shabaab ranks. The Mogadishu administration welcomes Sheikh Dahir's move to turn allegiance without force. The federal government of Somalia is very pleased that uh, Hassan Dahir Awais uh, is in the hands of uh, uh, and Heb authority. Uh, and our government is determined and committed uh, to continue dialogue and discussions to solve uh, this issue peacefully. All we want is, and we have been saying this to a very long time, those in Al-Shabaab who are Somalis who are willing to renounce the violence, we welcome them and we are ready to negotiate. The Adad town administration where the Al-Shabaab leader is held in custody is now discussing handover of Sheikh Dahir to the Somali federal government. As you can see, one of the prominent figures has, uh, like you said, surrendered to the, to, to the uh, our authorities and hopefully the, the rest will follow. Uh, and so uh, this can only benefit our, our, the government and the Somali people. Uh, so we can uh, truly now go into all areas of Somalia and truly you know, spread uh, you know, uh, what the government is all about. An internal infighting within top al-Shabaab factions in the Somali coastal town of Brava has resulted in the deaths of four members of the group last week. Sources reveal that Hassan Dairaway's fell out with Al-Shabaab Ali this year made disagreements over strategy. There are, however, lots of speculations on how the Mogadishu administration will deal with Dahir once arrangements to hand him over are complete. Mohammed Yumogi, CCTV, Mogadishu. Time for a break when we return. Britain and Mari sails through the fourth round in his bid to win the Wimbledon title. Olympic champion Andy Murray continued his perfect start to Wimbledon with a straight sets victory over Tommy Robredo to reach the fourth round of the Grascott Grand Slam tournament on Friday, playing under the retractable roof on central uh, center court because of a persistent rain, Murray was in control throughout and advanced with a clinical 6-2, 6-4, win. The second-seeded Murray, who missed the French Open because of a back injury, has yet to lose a set at the All England Club this year. After losing to Roger Federer in the final last year, he's again bidding to become the first Briton to win Wimbledon since Fred Perry in 1936. Right, let's turn our attention to the Confederations Cup, where with just a day to the final, Spain takes to the training pitch, practicing in the heat ahead of the hotly awaited clash of the Titans. Spain set up a final against Brazil on Sunday at the Maracana in Rio de Janeiro. The world and European champion Spain overcame Italy 7-6 in a penalty shootout after surviving an energy-draining semi-final on Thursday. Brazil, who beat Uruguay 2-1 in Wednesday's semi-final, will be looking for their third successive Confederations Cup title and four overall. The tournament is being used as a test event for next year's World Cup finals in Brazil. 
We are playing at home with the support of our fans and we know our adversaries well. The team is ready and full of enthusiasm. For football fans worldwide, a Brazil-Spain match is one we will want to see and it's befitting that they meet in the Confederations Cup Finals. Mozambique has become the world's first country to have an ethanol cooking biofuel plant. The plant in central Mozambique has specifically been designed to produce a sustainable cooking fuel which is produced from cassava. This project hopes to boost the incomes of 1,500 local farmers while creating a supply of clean cooking fuel that can be used as a mass market alternative to charcoal. CCTV's Julie Shire brings us more. Mozambique has emerged as one of the world's fastest growing economies with foreign investors showing interest in the country's untapped oil and gas reserves. Yet poverty remains widespread, and 50% of the population live on less than $2 a day. Maputo, Mozambique's sprawling capital, clearly shows the country's poverty. Much of the city is barely paved, and the vast majority of the city's 2 million residents still cook with deadly charcoal. A reality that Clean Star Mozambique, an integrated food, energy and forest protection business, wants to change. Through ethanol-based cooking fuel made from cassava, Clean Star is able to provide a new affordable cooking solution to many Mozambicans. The cooking liquid is called Zilu, which in the local dialect means fire. An inexpensive liquid that is used on an affordable new kind of stove, which many low-income families are switching to. It is clean, doesn't smoke, there is no risk, it is safe and it is also cheap. We are very happy because we are bringing a change to the country and hopefully to other cities in, in Africa. We plan to reduce a lot the health, respiratory health problems, which is a big, big cause of health problems and it's an area where the government spends a lot of money. We also contributed to reduce deforestation. It is here where the ethanol produced from cassava is brought. It is bottled and then distributed to the main retailers in Maputo. Five liters of this cooking product will approximately last a family of six a week and it costs six dollars. Every stove sold at Nitzilu to a woman on the outskirts of Maputo demonstrates how women are investing in their families and developing the next charcoal-free generation. Julie Shire, CCTV News, in Maputo, Mozambique.